Okay, um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015. Can I remind everybody present that electronic devices should be switched off at all times? Our first item is to consider whether to take item three, which is a consideration of our annual report in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Um, uh, Liam MacArthur is not present at the moment, but uh, that's because of technical difficulties with his plane. He will be joining us shortly, hopefully, assuming it's uh, on its way. Um, so he makes his apologies, but hopefully he'll be with us uh, quite soon. Can we move on now to item two on the agenda, which is the final evidence session of our inquiry into the attainment of pupils with a sensory impairment. Can I welcome to the committee Dr Alistair Allen, Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages, and his supposing officials. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, and I believe, Minister, you've got an opening statement you want to give us. Uh, yes, thank you, convener. Uh, just uh, as you've mentioned there, I've got uh, Leslie Brown here from uh, Education Scotland and Colin Spivey from the Scottish Government's uh, Learning Directorate. Uh, with me, with your permission, I, I may bat some questions for further detail on to them, as usual, yes. if with your permission. <laughs> um, but I'd like to thank uh, the committee for taking such an evident interest in this subject and welcome the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, the issue of attainment of school pupils with sensory impairment. Uh, as the committee will be aware, the, attainment, the, sorry, the Additional Support for Learning Act places education authorities under duties to identify, provide for and review the additional support needs of their pupils. And it's this support tailored to the individual needs of children and young people, coupled with the personalised learning offered through Curriculum for Excellence, which supports our aim of all children and young people making the most of the educational opportunities which are available to them to enable them to reach their potential in learning and in life. The committee will have noted that the position in relation to learners with hearing impairment is improvement, improving. In particular, it's worth stating that average tariff scores and lever destinations indicate sustained progress. Visually impaired attainment has been sustained and that we will continue to focus our efforts on securing uh, sustained improvement. I know you have also had a chance to see for yourself some of the excellent practice at Craigie and Windsor Park schools. The professionalism and dedication of staff in these and many other establishments is evidence, uh, and evident uh, and should be applauded. There is much good work going on, I believe, convener, uh, in local authorities across Scotland against a background of a tight financial position and competing priorities. But in addition to all that, we provide direct national funding, for example, to the Scottish Sensory Centre, Call Scotland and the Royal Blind and Donaldson Schools. But all of that said, we do recognise that there is still significant room for improvement the committee have heard and know evidence already from experts in the field and I'm aware that issues have been raised, uh, amongst others around support data, training of staff, uh, inclusive education and transitions. So I will look carefully at the evidence that the committee has collected and any recommendations it makes uh, that would improve the lives of our pupils and I'm very happy to respond to any questions the members might have. Thank you very much for that, Minister, um, and thank you for attending today. We're just going to go straight to questions, if you don't mind, um, and we'll start with Chick Brody. Chick. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I wonder if we... I mean, just go back less than a minute, when you said there are some... You know, the local authorities are doing uh, good work, and we had there are some good authorities and some bad authorities, local authorities, in terms of how they approach the issue of um, pupils with impairment. Um, we also heard from you know, the Scottish Cent uh, Sensory Centre, East Renfrewshire Council, that in some cases those with an impairment are uh, doing as well, if not better, than those with, with, uh, w w with no ASN. I wonder if you can, given the... the focus that there is on the scale and the attainment gap uh, between pupils generally, but between sensory impaired pupils and other pupils. I wonder if you can indicate how you see us being able to close that gap as far as sensory impaired pupils are concerned. And why, that's the first question. Second question is, why do we have situations like East Renfrewshire Council and some good authorities uh, and some 
not so good authorities? I mean, what can we do to bridge the gap between them? Well, the first thing to be said is uh, that, as you've indicated, the, the attainment gap uh, between uh, uh, sensory uh, deprived uh, young people and other people, uh, is, it is clearly real. Um, one thing that we, we do know, however, and I, I mentioned it, touched on it, is the, uh, the, the situation is definitely improving, real as the gap still is, but the attainment is certainly improving. Uh, amongst uh, the pupils that we're talking about. For instance, the average scores for um, deaf school leavers have increased uh, on the tariff scale from 225 to 289 between 2009-10 and 2012-13, and for visually uh, impaired school leavers from 161 to 241 over the same period. Now, I don't mention these statistics to take away from the point that you're making, which is that the gap is real and it is a gap that we, we seek to do something around. In terms of, you ask what the government is doing to try and address that, uh, well, there are a number of agencies that uh, are funded directly by the Scottish government with a view of, of achieving just that. Um, not least the Scottish Sensory Centre, um, which gets a, a grant of uh, £150,000 for 2014-15 and 2016-17. And that seeks to support teachers of the deaf and of visually impaired pupils and of deaf-blind pupils, indeed. The other thing that we do in terms of direct funding to address the problems that you mentioned uh, is providing funding to Call Scotland, which gets a grant of... Uh, £367,000 uh, for 2014-15 and 2015-16. Uh, and again, that, that seeks to provide uh, assistance through the provision of assistive technology uh, and uh, other uh, interventions that can seek specifically to, to address the gap that you mentioned. Okay, thank you. I, I wonder also, one of the... I mean, that, that's very important and... and um, I think as our evidence has shown that yes there has been improvement but some authorities why is there no consistency uh, in terms of closing that attainment gap across local authorities well of course the as uh, you may tire of hearing education ministers say this of course but it, it remains true nonetheless the the education authorities are the local authorities in question um, that doesn't mean that the Scottish Government has no responsibility in this area, um, but it is for the education authorities to assess how best they wish to, to deploy their resources. There are a number of things, and the, the things I've mentioned, that the Scottish Government does uh, at a national level, um, but the, the, the legal authority does still rest with the, the education authorities. I'm going to look, with your permission, to officials here to see if they, they want to say anything more than what I already know, which is, of course, that Education Scotland does seek to uh, promote good practice between local authorities and to share that good practice. Thanks, Minister. Um, Education Scotland inspection evidence points to this also being impro an improving picture across inspections done right across all sectors and specifically with re in relation to um, the, the establishments that are around uh, for sensory impaired young people. Um, in addition, our inclusion team work very closely with local authorities and we are um, authorities have particular matters that they want to improve on, they come to our organisation and we work with those authorities and with specific schools to help to support their practice. Um, and, and we've got a strong track record in, in taking that forward. Thank you. Yeah, just one last question, if I may. In, in terms of, uh, clearly and rightly, we've been focusing, and the inquiry has been focusing on, on attainment uh, and those with uh, sensory impairment. But, what we haven't done is, is at this stage, but I would appreciate your views, is look at the, des the positive destination the, the, in terms of a, how we can affect meaningful transitions to employment and indeed to further education. I wonder if uh, you have any views that you might express on that, Minister. Well, clearly transitions uh, are very important in all of this, uh, and you will... Seen, I've seen, I'm sure, from the, the statistics that, for instance, young people with sensory impairments uh, have traditionally been 
uh, overrepresented, you might say, statistically, I hasten to add, overrepresented uh, in the further education um, sector the, when it comes to transitions from school, uh, from, from terms of school leavers, um, and they have done very well in that sector. Um, where they've been underrepresented have been uh, in terms of going into the, the world of work directly from school and into higher education. On all of those fronts, it should be said, however, the, the figures have been improving, and I've, I've mentioned uh, some statistics, but I think it's worth pointing to the, the statistics around uh, transitions, um, uh, for instance, uh, the, for uh, leaders with a hearing impairment um, those uh, with uh, a transition into higher education has gone up in the last four years from 12% uh, of that, that cohort to 20%. Um, those going into work has gone up from 9% to 12%. So there are slowly improving uh, pictures there, um, but I do concede that there's a great deal still to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Mark Griffin. Just a small supplementary. Have you given the large proportion um, of um, pupils with a, a sensory impairment who go on to further education. Is there any further work done on the transition beyond um, college to see um, if those students are going on to work or are going on to university? Is, do we have any statistics um, beyond that transition from school? Well, I may call for help on that one, but what I can say is that uh, one of the uh, things that I think is, is close to all of our hearts and all this is to make sure um, that uh, whether it's people who are visually impaired or uh, people who are deaf or people with any other disability find their way in college, particularly in the further education sector, uh, into courses that are, are leading them purposefully and helping them purposefully achieve the, the career ambitions they have uh, and that they are not merely... Um, pushed from one course to another, we do need to make sure that, that uh, we respect the, the right of these young people to, to have the courses that they feel will lead them into employment. In terms of whether there is data held on transitions beyond college and university, I, my impression is that there is not, but I may be corrected. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm, I'm not aware of, of any data at this stage, but um, just to go on to say that in terms of the developing the young workforce work that Education Scotland and the government are involved in at the moment, that we are about to launch new national standards on work experience and careers education, and those are going to be launched for feedback with an, and a specific focus on equalities. In addition, scoping works already underway to identify how best to support young people and specifically young people with sensory impairments into the world of work and also to support the needs of practitioners, teachers and employers. And that work has begun already. Um, a couple of other um, uh, specific examples as well around this. Uh, the Scottish Funding Council funds Enable Scotland uh, to deliver uh, a Transitions to Employment project, which specifically focuses on um, this area. Um, and also there's a, a publication called, Transition, uh, called Partnership Matters, which describes the roles of agencies uh, supporting ASN students to move um, uh, at various points of transition from school to college and from, from college uh, or, for, or higher education uh, into employment as well. Uh, that's a, a 2009 publication, but it's due to be updated this year. Thank you. Can I just follow that up? You, you mentioned earlier, Minister, the, the, that um, those with a, um, either a, a hearing or a, or a visual impairment were, statistically speaking, overrepresented in the uh, further education sector. Isn't that, if it's not proof, does it at least suggest the um, idea that those particular young people are being put on college courses, perhaps not for the correct reasons, and effectively are doing what you just said yourself, going from college course to college course, rather than going off to a college course for a purpose to then move on into the world of work or indeed move on to higher education? Well, for instance, if you look at the, the figures over the last few years, uh, <coughs> I, I hasten to add, many people, whether they are uh, visually or uh, otherwise uh, impaired or not, are going to college for the right reasons. Uh, but I think uh, it's interesting to see that the, there has been a a slight levelling off and that the, the numbers have been getting better 
uh, for people going into work and to, when I say better, more like the, the cohort that, of, of other young people. Um, uh, and also in terms of, of going to university. I think, uh, I think it has to be said that uh, there's obviously great change happening, as, as people know, in the college sector. And I think one of the, the reasons for that change uh, is to ensure that, that young people, whether they have a disability or not, um, feel that the courses they're on are, are likely to, to lead them into work. I think there is a, a better sense of that. And I think there is, um, in spite of uh, the, the, the period of great change we've gone through in the colleges, great evidence that, that uh, people with disabilities uh, are continuing to, to make use of the college sector. In fact, the percentage of uh, young people going through our colleges with a disability uh, is higher now uh, than it was. I think it's gone up from 19 to 22 per cent uh, in the last three or four years. So people with disabilities continue to make use of college, but I would like to think, um, based around the point you've just made, that they feel they have the same choices as other young people uh, and the same choices about work when they come out the other end of college. And my question in no way is to denigrate the quality of the further no, education I realize sector. That. Um, but it, it does, I think, at the very least, concern me slightly that there is a... a I wonder if you would accept the, um, the risk that uh, young people with a sensory impairment um, have been put into college courses for the wrong reasons. And it's not to denigrate either them, their parents, their teachers, or indeed the colleges, but effectively have been circulating in the college sector rather than getting on and getting out into the world of work. That does seem to be, it has been suggested by others before now. I think uh, young people, whether they're visually impaired or uh, whether they're deaf people, they have anecdotally suggested that they have felt that they weren't given the choices that other people were in the past. Final question before, before I bring in uh, Mary Scanlon. You mentioned earlier the, the statistics about the increase in attainment um, for those with a sensory impairment. Um, could you give us a comparison between those statistics you gave earlier and uh, the general statistics for the, the population as a whole? Um, are, the, are the figures for the improvements for those with a sensory impairment greater, lesser, or about the same as the increases for the rest of the population? Well, I think this is, this is the area of challenge that I, I indicated before, which is that uh, I will look uh, to my right and left here for the statistics, but the, the picture is one where the, uh, the statistics have been improving uh, for those with a, a visual or impairment or who are deaf, but not quite at the rate uh, uh, as of the, the overall cohort of young people. Uh, for instance, uh, for visually impaired people, it would be compared to the, na compared to the, the overall cohort. I don't think we have the figures for the overall cohort with us, but it's... Um, I, I have, don't, don't have the figures for the overall cohort. Uh, with well, if, if, you don't, if you don't have them to hand, Minister, um, uh -huh. perhaps you could write to us afterwards and give us the, a comparison between... Uh, those with a visual impairment, those with a hearing impairment, and the population generally, so that we can make them. While it's very welcome, of course, that you know that there's a, an increase in attainment amongst those groups, it would be nice to see a comparison, so we can see whether or not they are improving at a faster rate or I, I, just the same rate or a slower rate than the general population. I can certainly provide that for you, convener. Although uh, I'm happy to concede that my impression is that statistics do show that uh, the improvement uh, overall has been greater slightly than the improvement for the, the two groups that we're talking about, visually impaired and people who are deaf. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, Mary Scanlon. My questions uh, are looking at um, the recognition of early identification of sensory loss. We all know that can have a positive impact and reduce the potential for negative outcomes. Um, last week's evidence, I think it was the National Deaf Children's Society, maybe it was a week before, uh, but they mentioned that um, the newborn testing that was introduced in 2005, that uh, no guidance has been um, uh, published by the government in 10 years, and there's a fairly ad hoc approach to that across Scotland. Um, so it's really just to ask why that, uh, why that guidance hasn't been published in 10 years. And given that many children may miss out on that or may not get the support they need. Can you tell me uh, what testing takes place with the 
development check between 24 and 36 months in terms of sensory impairment? Well, the, there is, a, as you mentioned there, a, a, a screening um, uh, programme, uh, the introduction of the universal newborn hearing screening in Scotland. Um, uh, the, it is true to say the Scottish Government has not published any guidance in terms of the, the post-diagnostic side of that and subsequent early year support and guidance, however, uh, is certainly there. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, the government uh, commits funding to in the form of the support uh, that we give to uh, the National Deaf Children's Society and others. Um, the Scottish Government's sensory impairment strategy, however, uh, does exist. It was launched in April 2014, and that does cover uh, both children and, ad and adults, uh, and uh, does uh, ask that uh, uh, local partnerships are developed to uh, ensure care pathways uh, for people with a sensory impairment. So I accept the point uh, about formal guidance, and I'll ask officials to say more about that. But as I say, the, the fact that the uh, strategy is there, I think, uh, uh, is a, a support to families uh, and to, to deaf people more generally. And uh, just to, to um, echo the Minister's comments, that, that there is that guidance hasn't been published, and, and um, we will look at, uh, in conjunction with health colleagues, um, as to, to why that uh, is, is the case. But uh, as the Minister has indicated, there is work ongoing around that at the moment. That's very helpful. The evidence we heard uh, did say it would be very helpful if there was uh, uh, government guidance. And the, the second part of my question, the development check, 24 to 36 months, are sensory impairments included in that check? Uh, my impression is that they are, but I'll have to ask for advice on that. I don't have the evidence um, in front of me at the moment, but very happy to supply that for you. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I will write to you about that. OK. Uh, quite like that, as soon as it's very helpful. Sometimes I'm sure that the Minister will um, follow up in writing. Yes, we'll uh, chase that up. I, I would have hoped they would know that, but never mind. Um, and the, the next question is, um, how do you check that additional support is being uh, identified for each and every individual child that needs it. Uh, how is it identified and how is it supported? And uh, for Leslie Brown, uh, convener, she did mention inspections. Uh, and I have to say over the last, well, since 1999, I've really had a quick look through all the inspection reports for Highlands and Islands. And unless I'm missing something, but I can't actually remember any inspection report saying that there is a, a focus on additional support needs. So is that a part and parcel part of every single inspection or is it maybe just not always reported? Every, every single inspection that, that we do, both in terms of early years and school inspections, covers quality indicator 5.3, which is meeting learning needs. And that has a specific focus on the needs of all young people, but as well as that, the needs of young people and, and children and young people with specific additional support needs. And prior to every inspection, uh, inspectors are given information on the range of needs of young people in the establishment. So whether that's a hearing impairment, a visual impairment, a disability, etc. And what would happen in an inspection would be that inspectors would follow specific audit trails of those young people to check on whether their needs are being met. So that's reported on within the letter to parents in, in each inspection that we do. But that's about meeting the, le the, the learning needs. Yes. What I'm really <coughs> interested in is, are, they, are the learning needs all identified? What happens on an inspection is we look at how, how effective the establishment is at identifying the learning needs of, of children and young people. And that's very much part of our audit trails, is to look at does the establishment and do the staff actually understand who the, young, who the children and young people are who have identified needs and what steps are they taking to make sure that those needs are being met. So that's very much part of our inspection activity. But obviously if the health check, the development check... Uh, which I thought you would know about, between 24 and 36 months, if that does what it's supposed to do, that should inform this process. But you're not aware of it or you don't have any information about it. Evidence. Pre-school pre children, 
that would help to inform this process, yes. wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Yes. And in, pre in, in, in early years, inspections are exactly the same as school inspections. And we would, our expectation would be that practitioners would take on board all information available to them about the children and their care to then plan for the needs of those children, both at, both at the early stages and then in their transition to school. OK. Last week, Education Scotland acknowledged that further work was needed um, Bit of an understatement, but never mind, to improve the attainment of sensory impaired pupils. Um, could you tell us what specific measures you intend to prioritise in that sense? Well, one of the things that is relevant <coughs> that it picks up on a point I think you alluded to here before, and I know that you've raised quite rightly in, in Parliament before, is about work at the early stages within families yeah. and the whole issue of communication within families, given that 90 per cent of Deaf children are, are born into families where the, the parents are. Oh, I, I hate. I'm sorry to have stolen that from you, but I know it's, it's okay. relevant to the point you, you were making earlier about support for young families. Um, uh, and it's it's worth saying that obviously the the um, the, uh, the funding from the government uh, uh, amounting to some 281 thousand pounds from the government to the NDCS is centred around this idea of intervening uh, helpfully in those family situations to uh, help to provide uh, the communication skills that uh, are needed for, for families to support their own children. So I, mean, I would take the question all the way back to this, this initial point about how we support families from the word go. Final question, convener, was uh, there's no point in putting in an amendment if I'm going to have it totally rejected, but it was on uh, Mark Griffin's bill, and uh, I appreciate that you're uh, writing guidance, and I wondered if within that guidance, if I know you're not writing it now, I appreciate that, but would you be minded to include within that guidance, um, uh, I've forgotten the full title of it, uh, help for families as well as help for children, given that 90% of deaf children are born to hearing families and that their BSL is so much more advanced and better communication within the family. Is that something you would be minded to uh, include within your national framework or whatever it's called? Well, as you, as you mentioned, so much of this hasn't been written yet, but I'm, I'm very open to, to ideas on this. Uh, I, I know that, uh, obviously, working, uh, work, working with Mark Griffin uh, around his bill uh, has been very helpful, helpful to the government in that it's uh, made, us, made us think about this. I think a, a large part of the focus of the bill itself obviously focuses on, if you like, the status of, of BSL as a language, status culturally, its status within our society. Uh, but it does raise bigger issues about the status of, of BSL and the family. Uh, again, I might uh, ask Colin uh, Spivey if he wants to say any more about that but I'm very happy to be open to ideas about anything we can do working around the bill that, that helps the status of BSL within the family as well as wider society. Um, as, as you've indicated, Minister, the, the guidance I think is at an early stage of, of, of being prepared, and I think officials would be um, uh, keen to, to um, um, take on board any views in, in conjunction with ministers. Ramai? It would seem so. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mary. Um, supplementary from Siobhan? Yes. Uh, Minister, you spoke obviously about the, the numbers and the attainment gap, and, and clearly you, you give us more detail uh, in writing. But I wanted to know what specific things will the uh, Scottish Attainment Challenge Fund do to address this problem? We know money has already been allocated for specific authorities, but where will this money go to help the children that we were discussing in this inquiry? Obviously, the, the focus uh, of uh, the money you mentioned is uh, around uh, closing the attainment gap more generally, specifically within seven local authorities, but with the potential to, to extend beyond that. But I think, given what's already been said about the, the recognition of the fact that within those local authorities, uh, children uh, uh, who are visually impaired or who are deaf have an additional uh, reason uh, uh, to be... To be um, on the wrong end, if you like, of an attainment gap. Uh, I would hope that the attainment challenge will ensure that there's an even greater focus in those areas to, to help those young people. I disagree with anything you've just said, but given that we're asking for specifics, because that's what we're hearing from the evidence that we've, we've heard in, uh, for the past three weeks now, 
people looking for specific examples of how we can work together, we can learn from, from local authorities who are, who are developing technology and, and various other things. It would be helpful maybe, again, if, if you're right to the committee and let us know what specific things that the government wish to do to tackle this. I understand local authorities will have to play their part, absolutely. Um, but again, we, we go back to Education Scotland and the specific examples that I asked about last week. What specific examples are we doing to challenge the difficulties that people are experiencing today? Obviously, local authorities uh, can, with, with assistance, uh, help to, to close the gap and, and are working to, to close that gap. Obviously, if you want me to be specific, £100 million is a fairly specific and substantial uh, endorsement of the work uh, of local authorities to overcome uh, the attainment gap. I've, I've mentioned some of the, the areas in which the government already seeks specifically to, to ensure that uh, the attainment gap uh, for this group of young people is closed. Um, for instance, uh, uh, the funding that we've given around uh, assistive technology is something that local authorities may wish to consider when they're in the course of uh, considering how to, to help young people in this situation. Uh, they may wish to learn from that or other examples. Uh, they, mish, they may wish to choose, for instance, when it comes to, to helping uh, young people uh, overcome their disadvantages, whether they be because of disability or otherwise, they may wish to consider uh, how they, they spend their money on staffing. Uh, they may wish to consider uh, the interventions that they provide and uh, tailored to the needs of individual young people. I keep coming back to the point that local authorities are the education authorities here. Um, but I think £100 million from the Scottish Government and the intention to work with them closely uh, is a pretty clear sign of our intentions. But again, specific examples on this group. And if I go back to um, the, the evidence we heard at the beginning about Enable Scotland and the, the money that has gone there um, and the lack of data that we have for people um, following on from college and, and others, it seems to me that if Enable Scotland had been working for many years on this, there would be data available and how that money is helping people because you would be evaluating that fund, I imagine. Um, so it's about what's already happening, the good practice there, how we're evaluating that, but the specific things that can be done to change um, because, as I said, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but we need more specifics. I think it's, as I've already conceded, I think we do need to have more uh, data around uh, where uh, people uh, who, with a visual uh, impairment or people who are deaf uh, go after college and university. I think that's, that's a fair point. I, I think, however, I would have to say in defence that we do have a lot of, of data, uh, uh, and I've quoted some of it, uh, about the uh, learner destinations post-school, the transitions post-school. Uh, I can quote some of the figures, as I say, from the, the last available year. For instance, for, for uh, le leavers with a, a hearing impairment, we do know, and we, we, we collate the data, uh, that 20% are going into higher education, 48% into further education, 12% uh, going uh, into uh, employment directly for leavers with a visual impairment. We do collect the data uh, that 18% are going into higher education, 49% going into further education, and 8% into employment. Now, I, I quote those statistics in the full knowledge that particularly on employment and on entry into university education, those figures are not what we would want them to be. Uh, they are improvements in the past, but they are not what we'd want them to be. We collect the data for that, for that reason. But I, I think it's a fair point that a number of, of members have mentioned, which is that we need to perhaps collectively think about how we track uh, this group of young people after they leave college and university. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam McArthur, did you have a small supplement to you? Brief one on, okay. on this. Uh, apologies, firstly, for, for being late. Um, I'm sure you'll need no convincing minister of the, the trials of flight. Um, unreliability. Um, in relation to the uh, attainment challenge, I mean, obviously there have been um, a broad welcome for, for um, the fact that the challenge has been set up, um, but concerns raised about an area-based approach, which uh, obviously um, will exclude a large number of areas, including um, those you represent and I represent. I, in terms of um, trying to provide the sort of targeted intervention that Siobhan McMahon was, was talking about, however that is delivered in whatever form, uh, how is that going to be delivered in those areas which fall out with um, the area-based approach the government's taking? I mean, particularly in island areas where I suspect there are probably additional costs uh, incurred in terms of delivering more specialist support. Well, I think uh, 
there's been an acknowledgement uh, from the government throughout this process that uh, there is a balance to be struck here. We, we do have to recognise the, the seven local authorities in Scotland which have a, a, an exceptional level uh, as local authorities uh, of so social deprivation and all that goes with that. Um, but there has been an acknowledgement at the same time, as, as you rightly say, that there will be pockets of, of poverty within overall affluent local authorities. Um, the government works uh, very hard with local authorities to, to reach those groups. Uh, and there's also been an acknowledgement um, from the First Minister and others, from the Cabinet Secretary, from myself, um, that we do need to do more, that we do need uh, to ensure that nobody is left behind in Scotland, not least in the context of what we're talking about today, young people with disabilities. Million that you've referred to a number of occasions this morning, um, that, that elements of that will be available to provide targeted support out with those um, seven local authority areas? Well, the, as I said, the, the project that's been described is, is for the seven local authority areas. So the, uh, the attainment uh, uh, gap uh, is being addressed in that way. However, there are things uh, in other parts of the country, for instance, the attainment advisors uh, and uh, the focus that, that will be placed on them to, around uh, raising attainment. That doesn't just apply to those seven local authorities. That applies across the, Scot across the whole of Scotland. But there's no budget attached to that. I mean, as I understand that that is redeployment of people who are um, perhaps employed in schools at the moment um, back into local authorities. Well, it will, it will provide a, a duty that local authorities provide people in those posts. It will, uh, require, it will place a... a, a, a an onus on local authorities to make sure that there is that focus uh, on attainment within their local authority, and it will apply out with the seven local authorities that I mentioned. Just to that, that's a, that's a duty rather than it's a, a duty. It's a duty, resource. and the, obviously the education authorities have certain duties when it comes to education. Thank you, um, Gordon MacDonald. You know, uh, I want to move on to the subject of uh, workforce planning, and we heard the evidence that in mainstream schools. Specialist teachers of the deaf and visually impaired were available for very limited amounts of time. And this was partially due to the ageing of the specialist teacher workforce. Given the lack of new teachers becoming specialist teachers, what steps is the government taking to try and tackle this issue? Well, this is an, an interesting area and one where we do need to, to gather information and where the, the government is working on that because uh, the, the numbers are small and I'm sure we can point to them there in some cases very small for, uh, for instance, uh, teachers with a main or other subject of hearing impairment. Um, there are, uh, I think the total is four, have I got that right, for 2014? No, it's, um, I think there's 58 for uh, visual impairment. So is that an increase of four? An increase of four, so 58 for, for uh, across the whole of Scotland. It's teach, teachers, especially qualified teachers, I think there are 58 uh, in uh, specialist teachers of visual impairment um, and uh, around 80 with uh, on hearing impairment. And that number has, you rightly say, as you rightly say, has decreased uh, on the hearing impairment side, but not on the visual impairment side. So, so the numbers are relatively small. There's an interesting question, for instance, around uh, hearing uh, impairment, whether we, we need to evaluate, for instance, some of the changes that have taken place medically and culturally, for instance, around uh, cochlear implants. Uh, I don't see that to, in any way to take away from the importance and the need for specialist teachers, but it would be interesting to establish whether... Uh, local authorities are changing their practice as, as a result of that situation or for any other reason. Um, there is no uh, uh, evidence that, uh, that local authorities are struggling to find teachers in terms of there not being qualified teachers available, um, but we do, need to, we do need to think about whether, the, um, whether the, the changes that there have been in this area are being reflected or what, what local authorities make of that. The, the Scottish Sensory Centre, when they were given their evidence, uh, highlighted that along with our partner organisations, they've introduced a range of training options, whether it's the mentoring scheme where um, senior staff can pass on their specialist knowledge to younger members of staff, creating pro professional development opportunities or producing online learning 
demonstrations of best practice. But what they said in their evidence was there's no point in Scottish Sensory Centre creating these opportunities if local authorities do not allow their staff to access the courses or they do not release staff to take them up. So what can the government do about that if, if the local authorities are not giving teachers the opportunities to take up? Um, I, I, I would strongly be of the view that local authorities would be wise to, to allow people to take up those training opportunities. I think there's been a, 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 an increased cultural understanding that uh, all teachers uh, now uh, need to have an awareness of the issues around uh, um, uh, deaf and visually impaired children, uh, uh, even if it's only at the level of awareness. Uh, I think, I'm sure you've had the same experience as a committee, but the number of of deaf young people who have uh, pointed out to me that uh, they wish more of their teachers understood that um, in order to be understood they couldn't speak to the whiteboard, they actually had to turn around and speak to the class. Now, I, I'd give that not as a flippant example, but uh, as an example that's been brought to me um, by deaf young people of the importance of local authorities engaging their staff in basic uh, awareness uh, and awareness raising as well as training. Given the small numbers of teachers, specialist teachers of the deaf and visually impaired that you highlighted a couple of minutes ago, um, is there, should we be incentivising teachers? Um, we heard the evidence that there was an absence of any specific reward that you know, a number of years ago did exist, and there appears to be no recognition within the profession um, for you know, teachers to specialise in and teachers of the deaf or visually impaired. Should, should we be doing something to address that? But the, the career pathways uh, and the, the promotion incentives are around that. I might defer to Colin Spivey there. Yes, you're right to say that there are no um, specific um, incentives, but I think um, the interesting point about this is, is that there are two sides um, uh, in, in relation to the, the numbers here. There's the supply side and the demand side. And as the Minister has suggested, and I think Education Scotland would uh, back this up, we're not hearing um, uh, uh, noises from the system that there are not enough um, qualified teachers coming into the system. Uh, that's from, from local authorities and so on. Obviously, you've heard evidence uh, um, that suggests that there may be a, a bigger picture on that. I, I think it would be uh, useful, and uh, I think the Minister has uh, uh, agreed to, to us having a, a conversation with the people uh, involved here, who being the, the employers, the local authorities, but also NDCS and, and um, officials about what, what the, uh, the, the actual position is in terms of, of supply and demand and whether there are um, enough teachers uh, in, in, in the system, because it's important that we properly understand um, what, 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 the, uh, what the full picture is. And in, in that respect, for instance, we're meeting with uh, NDCS, officials are meeting with NDCS in June um, to, to discuss this and a range of other issues um, as well. Just to be clear, are you saying you're confident that we have the right number of teachers in place, or are you saying you've got no idea whether we've got the right number of teachers in place? What we're saying is that there is no evidence at the moment, to, 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 no evidence coming back from the system, either through inspection uh, or through what we're hearing centrally, um, from uh, from local authorities that there is a shortage of supply uh, of, of teachers. However, uh, clearly the numbers have gone down and we need to understand whether that's just because the, there is less demand out there or whether there's a, there's a, a real um, effect, a real impact that, that, that needs to, to be looked at. One of the things that we are aware of is that the, the training changed um, some 10 years ago to a modular approach um, in, in, in delivery. And that was with good intention that, that um, teachers would be able, wouldn't need to take the time out in order to um, uh, uh, take the, the, the necessary qualification. Um, we perhaps need to understand fully, more fully what the impact of that, that has been and see if there are any unintended consequences. And I think a conversation with all, all the parties, that both those who are employing um, uh, qualified teachers in these areas, um, but also the groups that, that represent um, uh, children and young people with sensory impairment would be useful for us to, to, to get a fuller understanding of, of whether, whether, the issue, whether there is an issue and what that issue might, might be. Well, what I was trying to get across, and I think what, what Colin has, has been putting across as well, is that 
there's no indication that local authorities feel they can't find teachers. There is a debate to be had about whether the right number of teachers are in the system, obviously, but there's no evidence that uh, local authorities cannot find qualified teachers. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Fred. While we're on the, the subject of investing in the skills and qualifications of um, the workforce, I'd just like to put a question to you, Minister, that I've put to the previous panels. That's just to ask if you think it's appropriate or acceptable um, that for deaf pupils who use BSL as their only language, for them to be taught by teachers who only have a level one qualification in that language? Well, again, uh, I, I can understand the, the point that, that you're making there. Uh, certainly, I think the more that can be done to uh, promote BSL in schools, and of course your, your, your bill is, is relevant around some of this as well, uh, the more that can be done to promote wider understanding and use of BSL, uh, the better, and the more we're likely to see standards going up. I think, for instance, uh, the, the potential that exists, and it's a small scale at the moment, but the potential that exists uh, for hearing pupils and uh, indeed hearing teachers to be learning BSL uh, uh, within the, the wider uh, one plus two language movement, if you like, in schools is, is a healthy thing. I think there's a potential for uh, the third language within schools, language three, uh, in many cases, to become BSL, where there's, where there's a, a willingness within the school to do that. I think if we can see some of these cultural changes, we will start to see uh, qualification levels rise. But I, I understand the point that you're making. I understand why a, a pupil who feels that they are, are more fluent in their language than their teacher, I understand the issues that there are around that. Obviously, the case as it stands at the moment is that for a teacher of a spoken language, that they have to have a higher English, a level three qualification. Um, as the qualification of the workforce increases, would it be the government's intention at all to um, equalise that in any way so that the, the minimum requirements for a teacher of the deaf being a level three qualification in the same way that the minimum requirements for a a teacher in a spoken language is a level three qualification? Well, as I say, perhaps the, the first issue with BSL is, is raising the, the number, raising the pool of people from which teachers can be drawn. Uh, and I think that uh, sympathetic and understanding as I'm of, of what, what the member is saying there, that's, that's the reality is that we have to have a much wider pool of people who are, uh, who are learning BSL from which to draw. I appreciate the point you're making, Minister, and I, and I don't disagree with it, but the, the bar is set, the qualification bar is set at level one. That's, not, that's nothing to do with the size of the pool. The, the bar is set at level one. The bar could be set at level three. That's a decision that could be taken by the government, I presume, and could, could change that. About the, the size of the, the, the pool, and I know bars and pools are typical ministerial mixing of metaphors here, but... Um, the problem about setting the bar high, high of course, when you've got a small pool, uh, is that you, you may not, you, you may find yourself constrained. Um, you, you have to, you have to increase the, the number of people who are uh, learning BSL for there to be people who can meet that bar. I understand the point that's being made, and again, having spoken with and, and met with uh, 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 deaf young people. I can understand the frustration that is experienced by someone who is more fluent in their language than their teacher. Now, in secondary, we have to we have to recognise this comes back to my point uh, among uh, the point I made around uh, deaf awareness amongst teachers. We have to recognise that there needs to be a much broader uh, deaf awareness and deaf training amongst secondary teachers for the reason that in, in mainstream education, uh, a, a young person is going to have seven or eight teachers. Uh, possibly in a day. So there is much more we need to do about that. I may ask again for uh, any, any views from Colin Spivey, but I don't, I don't take away from the, the point that's being made, which is around the need for fluency. Um, I'm not sure I have m much to add on that in, in, in terms of the, the central point being the, the size of the, the, the pool and, and the, the approach that we're currently taking is one of expanding the pool rather than seeking to, to place constraints. Uh, I don't know from a, an edge. Just so we're clear, I don't want to have misunderstood you there. Yes. You, you, you seem to have just said there that you, you don't want to place constraints 
On the recruitment of teachers, I presume you were talking about of the deaf by increasing the qualification bar. Is that is that what you just said? I'm, I'm saying that, that at the moment there is no intention to, to change the qualification because level. I'm, uh, I'm following... rather taken aback by that comment because I can't think of any other subject um, where we would accept that the teacher was less able than the pupil in terms of the ability to communicate with each other. Um, I, don't, I can't think of a parent anywhere in Scotland who would find it acceptable that their child was more able than their teacher um, within the public sector education system. Now, and the idea that somehow it's placing a constraint on the recruitment of teachers by giving them, making them sure that they're adequately qualified to teach those children seems to me, frankly, a bizarre statement to have made. I mean, I think, firstly, the one thing I would say is, is that um, we're not uh, aware, and I think um, Education Scotland would, would um, uh, may have more to say on this as well, uh, that there are large numbers of, of, of people being taught by teachers at, at level one, uh, and therefore we're not, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, 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 the standard situation. Um, of the teachers of the deaf who are uh, using VSL are level one, and how many are at a higher level? We don't have that information. We don't collect that information. Will you collect the information and provide it? Yes. OK. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Chick Brody. Thank you. I wonder, uh, just just indirectly uh, associated with, with that, uh, that we've been discussing, um, I distributed an article that was in one of the magazines this week regarding uh, deaf and blind language interpretation and skills, uh, where the government... Uh, Westminster government, UK government, uh, has announced, had announced that it was delaying putting into place a national register of, of uh, those that can speak or use BSL. And in fact, have outsourced that capability to from the whole pool. I think 1,100 people who uh, have the capability at a higher, uh, higher level, uh, and clearly by having outsourced it, then the, the company involved might uh, reduce the standards because of the costs involved. I mean, can we have you the assurance that under no circumstances, at least while you're in the power to do so, no circumstances will we consider using any outside bodies to bring teachers, you know, who are subcontracted into our educational system to teach BSL language, and that we would consider a national register of uh, BSL teachers who are at a requisite uh, and desired standard? I think, I mean, the, the main point I would make there is that obviously to, to be a teacher in Scotland, you have to be GTCS registered. So that there's, no, there's no question of the, the standards around that or the, the professional um, expectations around that. Capability and, and able to disseminate. You mean, you the, tra you mean the training the of teachers? Are you saying the standard? If it's BSL 3, that has to be the standard that all teachers uh, must uh, adhere to. Well, the, the standards are the ones that we, we've talked about just now, and obviously there's been a discussion about whether they're high, high enough or not, but I'm not sure I understand your point about franchising out. Well, I'm just saying that's, what, that's what's happening down south, uh -huh. uh, and, you know, and, and what I'm saying is that around half uh, are considering leaving the, the, the BSL interpreter organisation, and I just wondered if that has a knock-on effect, potentially. I don't see, although I'll look for evidence here, but I don't see any evidence of that being mirrored in Scotland. Okay. We don't have any evidence that the same situation has been happening. No, I just want the assurance no. that that will not happen. Sir, what we'll do, we've got copies of the article that Chick Brody is referring to. It may be uh, helpful. We'll give you a copy at the end of the meeting so that your officials can have a look at that. Yeah, but well, I don't have any evidence that should be said of the, of the situation that's being described as I understand it. No. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. <coughs> Moving on to correct. Yes. Excellent. Um, Moving on to the, just the, the model of education provision, obviously um, there is a presumption of, of mainstreaming um, and I, I think intuitively that's something we would all um, uh, support and expect to see. But I think through the evidence we've had, there have been concerns raised about the way in which perhaps that's interpreted or implemented is resulting in both those with um, uh, um, hearing impairments or, or, or sight impairments are not necessarily getting the support they need 
at the age and stage that, that they're at. So at the point where they're perhaps um, needing habilitation skills, uh, the focus of the education system at that stage is on something rather different. Um, I mean, without sort of um, uh, suggesting that we should move away from the mainstreaming, are there things that um, you think that, that the government can be doing, working with local authorities, Education Scotland, whoever it may be, to try and make sure that the way in which that presumption is working is allowing enough flexibility to allow the needs of those specific groups to be uh, more better, uh, more um, effectively catered for? Well, this, uh, this uh, issue about uh, mainstreaming, obviously you're, you're right to, to point to the, um, the, the, the legal basis, if you like, of this, that there is a legal basis to it, and the, 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 the legislation makes clear that while mainstreaming may be described as the, the default option, it's certainly not the only option, uh, and that if it's in the best interest of the child for it not to be the option, it should not be. And local authorities know that, and they, they work within that law. I think that the real question is, when a child is in a mainstream school uh, with any additional needs, we, we have to work to ensure that those additional needs are met. Uh, and at a professional level, uh, teachers have to be able to identify barriers to learning uh, and to make sure that those barriers are overcome. So uh, I think we have, we have come a long way. We have changed. If you look, for instance, at the number of, of deaf children uh, who are in mainstream uh, as opposed to, to specialist education, uh, it is uh, it is transformed, um, and I think that we we have to ensure. And it keeps coming back to the point that's been quite rightly raised again and again, particularly in secondary, where a child is meeting a number of different teachers in a day. How many of those teachers understand what those needs are? Again, I I, I think I would agree with what you said, although um, in the, the, the problem as identified to us wasn't simply in relation to the more um, a sort of specialist subject teaching at a secondary level. I think one of the examples that was used to us uh, was the earlier years in primary, where, as I say, um, the skills in developing either um, habilitation or indeed confidence um, for, for those with hearing impairments or those uh, with sight impairments um, was fundamentally important to giving them the, the, the tools that they need in order to assimilate the other learning in due course. And that actually, by mainstreaming them throughout that, that primary schooling, even with, with buttressing that a bit uh, in the mainstream, it wasn't adequate to allow um, those skills to be, to be developed in a way that would allow them to get most out of the, the learning later in primary and then into secondary. Well, that, that's, it's certainly true, obviously, as well, that, that uh, by a child being in a mainstream school, and, and you're alluding to this, it, it doesn't necessarily, in fact, it doesn't mean that that, that child uh, which faces barriers to learning should have the same educational, uh, the same day-to-day -day educational experiences as other children and young people. There has to be a, a tailoring on the part of the school to the needs uh, of that young person. That may mean, for instance, uh, more time one-to-one uh, -one with a specialist teacher within the school. It may mean somebody additional being brought in uh, into the class to assist the teacher. It may mean a whole range of options. But I think we should be, be clear that because a child is in a mainstream school doesn't mean that that child does not get uh, the specialist attention that they need within that school to, to give them the same opportunities for learning as other children. I don't know if, if others want to, or with your permission, want to come in on that. I, I think the only thing I, I, I would add is that, um, obviously, the focus of um, additional support for learning is about the individual needs of the child. And, and, and quite often, um, there may be a range of conditions that, 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 that affect a child and a range of barriers to learning. And it may not, it may be that the, there is um, a visual impairment but there are other um, uh, factors as well. Uh, and so there's a, there's a requirement for local authorities to look at the, the, the individual and very specific needs of each child in terms of devising um, the appropriate uh, interventions that, 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 that need to be made. Um, and Education Scotland will, will look at that in terms of their, their inspections and the type of uh, uh, interventions that are made and whether they're appropriate. In terms of, uh, as Colin says, and, and following up on inspections, we've got some specific examples where um, we've worked very closely with schools and authorities to, to support them to improve their practice in, in these particular areas. And so primary is one example. Um, and that's very much the work of our team would, would go into build capacity and to actually look at what's happening and, and, and to put specific interventions and support in place. 
I mean, in response to the earlier question about um, uh, the demand as opposed to the, the supply, that the message coming through from local authorities is that there isn't a dearth of, or, or a lack of um, specialist teachers in, in, uh, in the system. Um, we've heard in response to Mark Griffin's question about um, the, the, the level of qualification achieved by, by those, for example, with BSLs, de dealing with those um, uh, who, whose main communication is through BSL, that that may be inadequate in, in areas, but we just don't know um, to, to what extent. I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely clear, given the evidence that we've heard through, through, uh, through this process uh, about problems that emerge at, at key stages, how effective that challenge function is being through the, the, the inspection regime that, that, that Education Scotland's undertaking and then the, fo the follow-up to it, because clearly there are, there are problems there. And whether or not it's local authorities saying we can do this uh, with some additional specialist support in those schools, um, because the, the consequence of not doing that is having to go down the specialist resource unit, which may be more costly uh, and more problematic for them. But actually, in terms of the interests of the child or the individual children, maybe exactly what they need. I, I keep coming back to this. I mean, you make valuable points. Uh, there's no reason for us to be complacent about the fact that uh, uh, an attainment gap exists. Uh, there, there's no um, reason why we, we shouldn't be seeking uh, to do everything we, we can and are doing everything we can uh, to, to ensure that that is addressed. And, and one of the, the areas that we, we have been working on addressing is around transitions, because um, I've mentioned a couple of times transition from primary to, to secondary and and the importance of ensuring that the environment that a child goes into is one uh, that's appreciative of, of the obstacles that can face uh, that child, that young person. Um, and the other transition, obviously, that we, we've talked about a number of times quite rightly, uh, is the transition from, from school, um, uh, where uh, we, we have to see improvements. We want to see improvements in terms of access, particularly to employment and also to higher education. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, Minister, I'd like to maybe uh, explore one or two issues that have come up about the learning environment. Um, a number of uh, organisations giving evidence, including the Scottish Sensory Centre, have talked about the issues around pupils who are with sensory, with sensory impairment who are concentrating more on academic entertainment and mostly doing quite well in that, uh, relatively speaking. But the necessary life skills in, in you know, creating confidence, effective communication, social skills and so on are perhaps coming secondary to that. And there's a feeling that perhaps there should be more emphasis on the life skills and maybe a little bit less on the formal academic qualifications. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I suppose one, one of the things that's come through um, from uh, the Wood Commission and from, from many other uh, uh, examinations of our education system is, is the importance of core skills, not just, if you like, life skills, but core skills that lead to employability, that lead to uh, transferable skills. Uh, and I think that uh, that applies just as much to, to young people with a, a disability as anyone else. But I do appreciate the point that, that's being made uh, around uh, the importance of giving young people uh, with a visual impairment or who are deaf uh, the confidence that they can apply for a job, the confidence um, that they can get on in life. And I think that there are uh, an awful lot of things being done uh, from very early years to try and instill that confidence. But yes, core skills, life skills are, are, are central to what we need. And I don't know if you want to say any more about that. Uh, only that, that obviously that's, that's um, uh, part of the approach of, of curriculum for excellence is, is to, to, to build rounded individuals with, 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 with life skills. Um, and so that's part of the, the fundamental approach that, 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 we, that we take. The, the other thing, of course, is, is role models. This doesn't just apply to young people with disabilities, but it applies to uh, young people from lots of groups in society where, um, for a whole host of reasons, perhaps around poverty or perhaps around... Um, historic um, problems in terms of social deprivation, um, the importance of providing role models to show that you can get a job in, in whatever sphere it is uh, applies particularly perhaps to people with the disabilities we're talking about who uh, there is no evidence to suggest are any less able uh, in terms of getting on academically, as you mentioned, than anyone else. But we need to ensure that they are given confidence and given 
given the choices that everyone else is given about their own future. Just looking literally at the, uh, the built environment, the, in England and Wales, they have statutory building standards, for example, for acoustics in schools. Do you think there's a need, perhaps, for us to uh, legislate or bring in guidance to try and improve the environment in our schools, particularly as there's a, a considerable new school building programme? It would be an opportunity maybe to incorporate that. Well, th this is an issue that the government's aware of around acoustics in schools, which have an obvious importance for, for, uh, uh, for deaf people. Um, while it's true to say that the, the legislative regime, if you like, is different in Scotland than England, um, there, there is, however, it's true to say, for instance, uh, the best practice that's adhered to uh, in Buildings Bulletin 93, I think I've got the right one there, uh, Buildings Bulletin 93, which does have guidelines in it around the issue of acoustics in schools. Now, it's fair to say that it operates under a different kind of static re regime to the, the one you're referring to in England. Um, but the, that bulletin has been used in a lot of the new schools that have been built in Scotland. I think it's uh, it's informed a lot of the design uh, of our new schools. Uh, we have, as you mentioned, uh, a, a whole um, swathe of, of new school buildings in Scotland which have transformed the way that learning takes place in schools. It's also transformed physically the, the learning environment which has become more open plan with people, particularly in primary, uh, learning in shared areas. So it is important we get the acoustics right. But as I say, bus uh, the uh, Buildings Bulletin 93 has been made use of, uh, and um, the school premises regulations do give certain statutory requirements around school uh, building design as well, optimising the internal environment. Uh, and uh, that's assist intended to assist local authorities with some of the very points you raise. Do you think there's a, a case for legislating in this respect, as they've done south of the border? The question is that uh, the, the, the guidance as well around this, or the, the, uh, the bulletin, I beg your pardon, uh, that's been produced around this has been helpful. It has informed uh, the design of buildings. If you were to start to legislate, you would, you would probably have to then work out where acoustics fitted in with competing priorities around things like ventilation, which, believe it or not, are competing priorities when it comes to a school building. You would have to perhaps rethink something that I think is already there and, and to a large extent already being made use of. Now, so just looking at another facet of the, uh, of the learning environment, we've been talking to witnesses about the merits of a centralised teaching approach, um, where a teacher that's qualified in BSL teaches a lesson that's transmitted to classrooms across the country. And that might help compensate for the, perhaps for some of the lack of teachers that are, we have with BSL. Um, has an evaluation on this type of centralised teaching been carried out? And is there any suggestion that might, it, it might appear on the agenda sometime? Well, there has been some discussion of this kind of approach, for instance, in very uh, rural and, and island schools about, uh, around the issue of the, the difficulty of, of, of uh, attracting specialist secondary teachers to, to many of the, the most uh, uh, rural parts of Scotland. So the, the debate is a live one, although uh, in terms of where it fits in around um, the issue around uh, visually impaired and uh, deaf young people, perhaps the, the debate about that is at a, an earlier stage. Again, I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Just, just to add that the um, obviously GLOW provides a, a, a platform for, for delivering that, uh, that kind of uh, um, um, intervention. I'm, I'm not aware that it's happening at, at the moment, Leslie, but uh, there is the, the technology yeah. is there to, 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 to do some of this stuff. Yeah, as you say, GLOW is available. I'm not aware that it's, it's being used at the moment, but certainly our teams are, are looking for good practice in that area, and I'm you know, happy to speak to them about ways in which that could be taken forward. I think one, one issue as well is uh, that, that teachers mention quite rightly is that they, they need, they're, they're busy people. They need to be signposted to, to where materials exist, whether it's on GLOW, online, uh, elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we do need to work together to ensure that that material is, particularly in secondary, is, is easily found for secondary teachers. Just, just a final um, point on that um, is I think we need to have some slight caution about that. Whilst I can understand that there may be advantages in, in, in looking at that approach, there, 
there is a need, obviously, to consider um, personalised learning and uh, the individual needs of the child. And some of that might get lost in, in taking uh, a, a kind of um, a un universal approach. It's not a reason for not doing it, but it's something that I think we need to bear in mind if we're trying that kind of intervention. Chief Rudy. I mean, we take the point that there are, and we have had uh, an email as a consequence of last week's a conversation uh, and you know the, there are caveats that are expressed in terms of you know mirroring uh, classroom studies but isn't it worthwhile now doing a pilot to look at what needs to be overcome so that we might be able to expand on this nationally I think it is it would certainly be beneficial to at least pilot this and, and explore the difficulties but also more importantly the opportunities I think if, if you're talking about the centralised, uh, centralised is possibly the wrong word, but the what using technology, technology yeah. Yeah. I think if we're, we're talking about using technology, I think the important thing is to, to recognise, as has been alluded to, that the needs of different children and young people are going to be very different from child to child, from young person to young person. Uh, I think there is a great deal that we could do, a great deal more that we can do and making use of that technology, making use of materials that, that, can, that are or could be made available online. Um, I would hesitate to use the word pilot, however, because that would imply possibly that we would find some school um, where there was a, this approach could just be um, applied on a blanket basis. Um, I think what would be much more useful would be to see nationally, if you like, how much uh, of the um, material that exists out there online or could be brought into existence online could be signposted to teachers around the country. I mean, we, we had an example last week, it was last week, of one council that it clearly is, is well in advance of, of others in terms of uh, addressing this issue. Would it not be possible to consider discussing with that particular council the, I won't use the word pilot, but uh, the, the, at least an examination of the, some of the challenges of, of remote technology use, uh, but also look at the, have them also look at the opportunities. I think where there are examples, and I know there are examples of local authorities who, who are good at doing this, I think what needs to happen, uh, and what Education Scotland are busy doing, is to make sure that other local authorities know about this, to make sure that that good practice is shared. Uh, this is something I know that you've been involved in and might want to say something about. But I think that's probably the best way uh, forward, is to make sure that uh, good practice in that is not hidden away anywhere in the country, but that all 32 local authorities get to know about it. No, I I, I'm obviously not making myself clear. So let me try again. We know that we have to share current good practices across councils, and, and that came out quite clearly in the discussion that we had last week. What I think we're asking for is you know, a means by which we can explore the use of technology much more um, beneficially, and also, as part of that, uh, secure the efficiencies that would come from Centralised, centralised teaching as one, one element of that. Um, I agree with you that we should be sharing best practice as it stands today. What I'm actually asking for is, will you consider engaging with, you know, I suggest with this particular council, to run uh, a, a test and exploration of the possibilities of technology and centralised teaching? I'm very happy to learn from the experience and speak to any local authority who can who can provide evidence of that kind. Yeah. A, it's a wider Thanks question. It's, as well as centralised teaching using BSL, for example, we have heard evidence, Minister, on you know the lack of subtitling on on programmes that are available for children in classrooms. A number of just basic technological issues you think would be relatively simple to overcome, which which seem to be causing problems. So I think there is a wider discussion and debate. I would agree with you to be had on this. Um, but I'm sure that uh, um, what concerned me certainly was the reaction um, from the Education Scotland witness last week who said, and I may not be quoting exactly, but basically said something like, such suggestions were not currently on the agenda, which was a rather a, a, a kind of flat no 
to the suggestion that technology had a role to play here? Well, as, as I've indicated, uh, you know, if there are local authorities or others who've got good uh, practice, I'm very willing as Minister to learn from it. Um, is, it the is there a possibility that, for example, such suggestions as this could be discussed in the advisory group that you're going to establish, assuming that the BSL bill goes through and passes stage three? Yes, yes, as I've, I think indicated to this committee before, one of the uh, uh, most impressive things, I think, about the, the bill is that the, uh, the content of the, the plans, which will essentially be the, the bit of the, the bill that, that changes things, uh, will be, to a large extent, very much in the hands of uh, deaf and visually impaired people. Uh, and they will, um, I th they will have a uh, big influence both over the, the national plan and also hope over at the plans at a local level too. There's a possibility that ideas like this one, and I'm sure others, um, could end up in the national plan. Well, certainly if uh, people want to bring forward ideas about ways in which national agencies, government agencies, can improve what they do, um, then obviously this is something that people want, would want to discuss on the, the National Advisory Board. Thank you very much. Uh, Liam MacArthur, did you have a supplementary? Or was it a it, yeah, it's, it's very tangential, but, but it's <laughs> on an attainment theme. When you say very it's, tangential, it's, you on a, it's on an attainment <laughs> theme. Um, <laughs> I'm, but not solely those with, with sensory impairment. Uh, Minister, you'll be aware of the concerns that have been raised in relation to the recent higher maths exam and concern amongst pupils that um, the exam questions bore little or no relation to the coursework they've been um, studying in the run-up to it. Now, it's, I, I know from the correspondence I've had from constituents that this undermined pupils' confidence in themselves. Um, it's, I think, undermined pa parents, staff and pupils' confidence in the exam system itself. Now, it would be helpful if you could offer some reassurance, uh, A, that the pupils that have sat that exam will not be disadvantaged as a result of that, and, and B, if there were lessons that could be learned to ensure that there isn't such a disconnect between um, the exams and the coursework leading up to it uh, next year, I think, I think that would be very helpful as well. When, when, the member, when the member talks about the higher maths, he, uses, he chooses the word tangential carefully, I take it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think <laughs> what, what I can say there is that, obviously, quite rightly, ministers don't set or mark exam papers. Um, what the SQA, however, always does is they always uh, look carefully uh, at all exams uh, after they've been sat and, and look at all evidence as to whether in any given year uh, uh, an exam paper is more or less challenging than in any previous year and that the grade boundaries are always set by the SQA independently based on their understanding of, of what the fairest solution is around that. So every year the SQA always looks at these questions of whether uh, where grade boundaries should be set in order to make sure that the fairest possible uh, outcome has arrived at. I, can I take it from that, um, that uh, as, as a result of this exchange perhaps and, and other representations, I'm sure the government has received on this, there will at least be conversations with SQA, not just about this year, because I take your point about um, the, the, the setting of grade boundaries, but actually what appears to be a disconnect in terms of the exam itself um, as compared to the, the subject matter that was being taught. In the I have to stress, will arrive at these decisions completely independently of ministers. Um, I have to agree with uh, Liam on this one, being a father yeah. of a daughter who's just sat higher maths and who feels exactly the same as I think many people did, that it seemed to be in some questions, at least minister, um, a, a test of English interpretation before it was a test of higher maths knowledge. And I think that is one of the questions that I think has to be addressed by the SQA. But I think we're, we are straying slightly from the, the point. So I, I, will, I will move on, giving that that, uh, that was a very personal intervention on my part. And, and that she is sitting behind you, Minister, so I, <laughs> I can see her face now. Um, move on, though. Uh, George Adam. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good morning, Minister. I'd like to talk about multi-agency collaboration. You know, there is good practice throughout the country, and uh, we've heard that news as well. But uh, there has been concerns from the Scottish Council of Deafness that said that that newborn hearing screening was positive in recording the hearing loss affecting young babies, but the information wasn't always shared with the right agencies. 
and uh, shared with the right organisations quickly enough. And I was wondering uh, if there's any way to improve information sharing among the relevant agencies, because obviously getting it right for every child and ensuring that uh, we can get the support mechanisms available for the parents and families as quickly as possible is one of the strong messages that's been coming out uh, with families dealing with sensory uh, impairment. Well, I think relevantly you, you refer there obviously to, to getting it right for every child, which is um, uh, is very um, uh, relevant to the to the issue at hand there. I've already mentioned uh, when, when Mary Scanlon was talking about families and I raised the issue uh, about uh, um, deaf children and hearing families, for instance, uh, about the, the need to ensure that different agencies do work together to ensure... Um, that families don't feel isolated, so that families feel they have sources of information. Uh, it's also, I have to say, one of these areas where, uh, despite all the controversy around this that was manufactured in some quarters, I think uh, named persons have, will prove to be an important source of information to families when they seek it. OK, thank you. Is that you? Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Any further questions from members? The stage. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Can I uh, thank you and your officials for your attendance today? Um, uh, we're most grateful for you taking the time to be at the committee. That concludes our evidence taking on the inquiry, and we will, of course, publish a report of our findings and recommendations later this year. Um, and I now close the meetings of the public as we move into item three, which is in private. <laughs>